My new book is all about American cooking. A good restaurant's real hallmark is its consistency, and I think that's what we strive to do. When you're talking about Italian cooking, we're talking about the cooking of grandmas. Famous chef Mario Batali was chosen to oversee this final state dinner. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Chef Mario Batali. <clears throat> well, hello, everybody. Welcome. I suppose you're wondering why I called you all here today. Today we're going to talk a little bit about the future of food, but of course you can't talk about the future without talking a little bit about the past. Food has been for a long time something that you merely needed to survive. In the last hundred years, food became something to be considered almost luxurious. Up until the middle of the 20th century, Italians didn't really eat antipasto. They had a big course of grain or pasta or a soup. And then they had a small portion of protein, often cheese or even just a piece or two of salami, and some salad or fruit. Uh, in the aftermath of the good industrial revolution and two world wars, suddenly the world became a little smaller, a little more wealthy, a little more, and only in certain spots, and a little bit more affluent as the world started to travel around and understand the world. And what we've discovered in the last 40 years is an affluent group of people traveling around the world looking to discover their newest and most authentic experiences and hoping to find a place that will reproduce them closer somewhere near to their house in the restaurant format or at their house as a cook. The future of food are your hands. What happened in my lifetime, and just a little bit before, I was born in 1960, that makes me old enough to be most of your kids' parents. Uh, what happened in my lifetime is that after World War II, the baby boomers gave the objective to our food producing community to create inexpensive protein and inexpensive vegetables so that we could proceed forward in progress and make something really good about America. And this is not their fault. The meat industry decided to make something inexpensive and they did a good job at it. And what they lost was a certain, to a certain extent the deliciousness, the uniqueness, the remarkableness of non-repeatable vegetables and proteins. We got lean pork, we got factory produced chicken, but we got it at $1.49 a pound. So they responded by giving us things that were more based on convenience and price per yield than on delicious and unique products. That happened in America and it happened a little bit in Western Europe, it didn't really happen anywhere else. So we're kind of the guinea pigs, we're where all of the fads, where all the trends, all the stuff comes and happens first. And then we try to figure it out and the rest of the world either scolds us or ha gets happy with us and suggests that yes, you guys did it first and now you messed it up, what are you going to do first? Well, as it turns out, we've got a lot of things and we're thinking about a lot of things. There's a lot of really smart people trying to figure it out and try to do or undo what we've done to our own waistlines and our own sugar ability and our own kind of lifestyle in the last 50 years. I would say that as the rest of the world has embraced our fast food ideology, stripped away our true understanding of what a carbohydrate is and done it with fast food, processed food and processed carbohydrates, one of America's greatest exports, which used to be art, film and cars, has been diabetes, which is kind of sad. And when you see people lining up for fast food like McDonald's or Burger King or any one of them, all of whom are, don't have a mission to kill or poison people, but have been answering what they thought were the questions we were posing to them, outside of the United States, you realize, well, that's not a very good thing. 
So what has America been doing since maybe the 70s? Keep in mind, when I started to become a cook in 1978 in college, becoming a cook was not a glamorous position. Becoming a cook in 1978 was the last thing you did after you got out of the army before you went to jail. <laughs> because it was the lowest level career that anybody could, anybody could peel potatoes, anybody could get a job in the kitchen because it was kind of like the lowest job besides drinking sterno that you could possibly do. And so at that time, food was merely a convenience. Restaurants, super high-end restaurants were what they were supposed to be. They were, they were fancy, they were exclusive, they were invariably French. They were, uh, for the big cities, they were not for little towns. Little towns had cafes that recognized deliciousness and kind of supported things, but they weren't the thing. And food wasn't necessarily the main event that it is now. Food, in fact, even in the 70s and the early 80s, Food was something you did on your way to do something else. You would go to the game and get a bite. You would get a bite and go to the opera. You would go to the movies and stop by for a snack or get something. Since the early 80s when the Food Network became popular and nutrition became more than just a buzzword that you heard when you went to get your physical, suddenly food became something that was interesting. It was provocative. The creation of food was considered an art form. Cooks became chefs. Chefs became cool. Restaurants became places to spend your time besides just having a meal. Suddenly restaurant work was pop culture. Suddenly there were game shows. There were chef contestants. There was top chef, master chef, iron chef. The chef is an asshole. Like all of a sudden chefs are being talked about in movies. The whole world of chefs became something very significant in the world and at least part of the fabric of pop culture. That led people to want to be chefs. Now cooking schools are busy. People study food. There's food bloggers. There's food machines. There's food restaurants. There's people waiting in line to get ramen noodles. All of you don't have to wait in line to get ramen noodles. That's what you make in your dorms, isn't it? That's what we made. In any case, food became something that was provocative, interesting, recognizable, and had a low threshold because you could honestly make it at your house. Which brings me back to these. The future of food is probably more now than ever in America in our hands. When you make any decision about the food that you're eating, the restaurants you go to, the kind of places you support, you must realize you are making a political decision. It is important to realize that everything that you buy and all the things that you support and all of the deliciousness, the provocative magnificence, the kind of ingredients you buy, they all represent, whether you know it or not, a decision that you've made. If you're buying things with a big carbon footprint, it's meaning that's what it is. It doesn't mean you shouldn't have a durian imported from Thailand every now and then. But you should think about sustainability. You should think about seasonability. You should think about local farmers. Now this doesn't mean that if you want to have a romaine salad in December or February, that you are breaking all the rules and Alice Waters will take you off her speed dial. Because it doesn't mean that you have to live by a strict one time only, only one way to go. There is a thousand ways to find balance in your life. And every now and then, doing something that is just zany, like a Caesar salad in February, made with romaine from California and imported anchovies from Spain, isn't going to kill you. It might actually make you very, very happy. But what you have to pay attention to is making sure that as best you can, the decisions that you do, the decisions that you make, are informed by decisions that you're captively and actively aware of that you're doing. So when you really pay attention to what you buy and how you buy it and how you eat it and how you enjoy it, make sure that it represents exactly what you think. If you like local and domestic and regional, then do that. But don't feel chained to it. Now, I have a new book out, and that's why I'm here. Uh, it's about American cooking. Now, 25 years ago, American cooking would have been thought of as hot dogs, hamburgers, macaroni and cheese, maybe a little barbecue. As I traveled around the country for the last 20 years, usually shilling a new book based on Italian food that you'd have to import at great expense on the internet to get all the ingredients to make the right dish as a Sicilian lifeguard just might make. I traveled around and I discovered all of these tasty little dishes and all of this remarkable cuisine. Now it had existed here for a long time, but where it came from wasn't necessarily America. It came from the immigrant experience. As people traveled here, whether they came over on the Mayflower or whether they came over on Delta Flight 493, which landed three weeks ago in St. Louis, 
they came here and what they've discovered is that their memories of their food, of their special occasions, of their birthday dinners, of their wedding celebrations, of their best dish ever, maybe they couldn't find that exact ingredient, but they wanted to make the dish anyway. So maybe instead of finding this particular yogurt or this particular kind of fermented milk thing, they found Philadelphia cream cheese and it was kind of close and they put that in there. And if they couldn't find the kind of sausage that they made, but they found kind of a kielbasa that was kind of close to it, they'd substitute that. And if their grandma didn't make the fermented cabbage stuff that made the whole basement smell really awful all winter long, but they found a really nice sauerkraut at the grocery store in a plastic bag, they've substituted that. What happened is we created a hybrid cuisine over the last 200 years that celebrates basically the roots of all of the immigrants. And as you travel around, it was surprising to find what kind of immigrants landed where and how these pockets developed their own kind of regional cuisine that is now identified as American, but at one point was Lithuanian, or it was South American, or it was Argentinian, or it was a particular portion of China, or it was from Malawi, or it was from wherever they came from in the world. The idea that is so compelling about it is that now it's American food. And whether it's hanky pankies in Cleveland, or whether it's an Iowa loose meat sandwich, or whether it's lomi lomi in Washington state, or it's a, a Navajo fry bread with a braised lamb dish in San Antonio. It is now considered American food and we celebrate it in such a way that it lets us recognize that yes, we are truly beyond a melting pot. We are a fast food delicious diner of magnificence around America. And when you taste all this stuff, it's not fast food like devoid of flavor, nutritional content and magnificence. It's fast food because we make it because we want to make it in a quick time. So there's long cooked things, there's quick cooked things, there's short cooked things, but they're based on the ingredients of each of the regions. And when you travel around Europe, that's exactly what they're based on. When you realize for the first time in your life, whether it's when you're 13 or 21 or 53, that yes, not only is Neapolitan cuisine different <clears throat> than the cuisine of Puglia, but that the cuisine of the Amalfi Coast is much different than the cuisine of Benevento, which is much different than the cuisine of the northern part of the Amalfi Coast, then you suddenly start to celebrate what it is about America that's so great. When people ask me, well, what did you discover that was so new? What was so exciting? Well, what was exciting to me about traveling around the country wasn't new stuff. It was old stuff. It was stuff that had been there for a hundred years in Charleston, making a low country boil, or when I'm eating a grouper sandwich on the, on the southern coast of Alabama and eating it the way they've been eating it that way, or traveling to Texas and eating a bowl of red, where you can clearly see the Latin American culture and a lot of the Mexican culture served in a dish of a bunch of people that had never even been to Mexico. And they're so proud when they serve you this bowl of red with some tortillas. And it's chili, but it's chili the way that they make it there is not like the chili that you eat at the, on a chili dog. It's something that is so remarkable and so delicious and so much a part of the Texas culture that you're like, wow, now that is interesting to me. So the future of food is as we discover all of these things and as we make them with our hands and as we celebrate our own unique background, our immigrant core, whether you immigrated from next door or down the block or whether you're from the Mayflower, everything that you can do to celebrate your own natural roots and the way that you do it and the way that your family did it or your adopted family or even people you never met and you just happen to study them a little bit, that's where the future of food is. Finding a way to garden, finding a way to make stuff by your hands, finding a way to ferment, finding a way to make your own bread, finding a way to make pasta, finding a way to get involved in your handmade stuff because at the end of the day, what makes it more interesting? What makes it more of a joy? When you're talking about feeding someone, you're talking about the ultimate gift. Outside of making love, there's only really one other way that you're gonna give someone to something that they're gonna put in their body, and that is food. <laughs> and if you understand the significance of that, then you will very carefully pay attention to what you're doing, just like you do on your techniques of making out. And you should pay attention to that. But it's the handmade that is the ultimate human gift. And it's the human touch, the caress, the way you knead your loaves that will make it something so remarkably special that it becomes the ultimate gift that you can do. And when you figure that out and when you master a dish, when you own it, when you make it the best of anybody you know, that's the future of food. That's all I got. Your president, ladies and gentlemen. How are you, Mario? I'm good, man. Great to see you. Good to see you. 
it's, it's going to be <clears throat> difficult for me to segue after what you just said. Everything is going to be down the tube. This is a college campus. We know what's going on. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we have also questions on the web, coming from the web. We have people <coughs> watching that all over the world, as I mentioned to you. Hello, world. Hello, world. So the world wants to know more about you. Not only about the future of food, but uh, the past and the future of Mario. So let's start with the past. So uh -oh. you told me you grew up in a family that uh, everybody, where everybody cooked. Yes, I grew so, up in Eastern, I was born in Seattle. I grew up in Eastern and Western Washington State in, the, in and around the Yakima Valley. <clears throat> when I was growing up, it was basically tumbleweeds and hops. Now it's croquet and Merlot. Merlot, yes. We'll come back to uh, okay. the Merlot situation and uh, California wines and uh, American wines. But I, you, know, you told me you were not viewed as the best cook uh, at home. <clears throat> if you talk to my dad, he's quite convinced that my sister Gina is a better cook than I am. So what happened to her? She, has, she took over my dad's salami shop called Salumi in Seattle, and she runs it like a... <laughs> she runs it tight. So it's delicious. I was there two weeks ago. So it's you, better than ever. Would you consider doing something with <coughs> her? No way. <laughs> Do not work with family unless you absolutely have to. Ah. So th that brings us, I will come back to the personal uh, dimension, but you know, since you opened uh, the chapter about uh, partners, what kind of partners do you seek? I actually don't really seek partners. What I have, and we have at this point 26 restaurants and uh, three about to be four grocery stores. We're opening in Italy here on the 29th. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> I, we did never had a uh, manifest destiny to open a bunch of restaurants. The reason we open new restaurants is because we have uh, an excellent sous chef or an excellent second in charge of the dining room or an excellent second in charge of the wine program who has become so good that they are obviously going to go work for someone else like Danny Meyer or Drew Nieperant or one of the competitors in the city. And as opposed to letting them go away with all of that excellent training. We say, listen, do you have a couple of bucks? Shall we put this together and let's build a restaurant together? So at this point with 26 restaurants, I have 24 chef partners, 24 general manager partners, and 24 wine director partners who I only opened the restaurant with so that I wouldn't lose them to my competition. So those are my partners. It wasn't like I went out and said, looking for partners, looking for partners. Let me turn this off. Are they calling you? No, somebody Another said, opportunity. No. <laughs> They'll call back. So, so what you're telling me is that, you know... The oh, there's a partner right there. Peter I Cameron know, Peter and I Cameron. were partners and our partners. Peter, Peter is an alumnus and a trustee here, and he's wearing uh, the Batali colors. So there was a partnership that started with uh, Lennox, a world-famous Did he ask you brands. to do an ad for him here? No, no, I just I support my partners whenever I can. Uh, okay. They came to us, and we talked to them about making this delicious line of, uh, delicious, magnificent, long-lasting line of home products yes. for the kitchen. And we did, and that's the kind of partnership I enjoyed. And it so, was working with him that made it so fruitful. So in, in, when, it, when it comes to quality <coughs> control in the 26 restaurants that you have, you can maintain it because you train them all. Well, also because they have each of those partners has a vested interest in the success of the restaurant beyond mm -hmm. merely looking like they're an owner. They manage both the costs and the success in a way that only owners would. And I think that the success of that is based on truly understanding that at 15 years ago, I would spend 100% of my time worried only about customer satisfaction. It is a different world out there now. Now I think I got customer satisfaction down. I spend 50% of my time on employee satisfaction uh -huh. because I don't want to lose them. And the longer an employee's been with me, the longer, the better they are and the more I can rely on them to understand the nuance of all of the details of the things that we do. So to train them for four or five years and have them leave because for some strange reason our messages were crossed or mixed is a waste of my time. So we have expanded our human resources department <clears throat> to include opportunities for people to grow. And also I no longer need them to do only my job. Like if someone wants to be an artist and work four, four nights a week as a, as a server or in the kitchen, <coughs> I'm happy to accept a new kind of, a new 
arrangement between us. I don't have to be their whole world and I don't expect them to be my whole world. Mm -hmm. If they want to be a painter or they want to be an architect or they want to be a landscape, landscape artist, whatever they want to be, I'm happy to allow them to do whatever they want to do in their world, provided when they're working with me, they're doing what I need to do and what our agenda, our mutual agreed agenda is. And that is a sea change from what the restaurant business was 30 years ago when I started and, you know, beatings were still a regular part of what the kitchen discipline felt like. No, I mean, I'm serious. Yeah. It was a very physical game back then and now it is a much different game it, and it's better for everybody. You mentioned American cooking. In California, for instance, we see something called fusion. It can be Chinese, American, it, it can be European, American, whatever it is. Are you covering uh, fusion food as being American food too? in this book? No. And why not? I, I would say there is fusion in that there are immigrant-based dishes that have transformed over decades into something that people know and recognize. And the dishes that I made are those very solid versions. Those, these aren't my takes on those versions. These are the dishes that really are what they are. At the bottom of the recipe, you might see me say in little orange print, if I was serving this at my house, I may add uh, chopped jalapenos or a little bit of chipotle Tabasco sauce or some cilantro or some lemon juice or some saltines with a lot of salt in them. <laughs> but that's because that's how I would cook for myself. But these dishes are the traditional dishes, the way they're served in their hometown, and that's what's important to me. Fusion is a tricky idea because most often fusion, unless in the hands of someone who really understands the two cuisines, like Roy Choi, who mm -hmm. does an interesting take on tacos and Korean food, but that was because he was an expert at both. Most fusion actually is only missing the first part of it, which is C-O-N. I found most fusion to be confusing and not truly that uh, fruitful it. for me. Like it's never quite Chinese or Cuban enough for Chino Cubano for me to feel that I'm really satisfied. I'd rather go to a Chinese restaurant or a Cubano restaurant. But that doesn't mean that it's not existent. It's just that wasn't, I, I couldn't get my hands around it enough to ever include any of those dishes in this book. Maybe, yeah, I, I understand. We, we're going to continue the conversation. We have questions, you know, from the web. We have questions coming from the audience. So if you want to raise uh, uh, a question, <coughs> raise your hand. As usual, the, you know, the question should be extremely short and it should be a question, not a comment, and with the hope that the answer would be longer. I'll see what so I got. Let's start with you from the web. Hi, so this one's from Facebook. Um, what inspires your cooking and are there times when you just don't want to cook? Um, I was originally inspired by the fact that my family uh, always cooked. We grew up in Washington State. We were a second generation immigration family, but both French Canadian, Italian. We always cooked, we, that was what we did. Like for us, a good time on New Year's Day was to make 400 pounds of sausage for the year. That was a woohoo. <laughs> when it was blackberry season, we would take our yellow Cutlass Supreme station wagon down to Dash Point Road in Federal Way and pick blackberries until we could no longer see each other because we had blackberry fights during the blackberry picking session. And we would come back and make enough jam and enough pies to last us for a year. So for us, cooking was foraging. Foraging was fun. It was something that we did. It was kind of a chore thing, but it was also just one of the things that we did. So cooking was always something that I enjoyed and I loved. And as a matter of fact, when my mom suggested that I go to cooking school instead of university, when I was a sophomore in high school, I had just seen Animal House. And there was no way I was going to miss out on this whole idea of college. <laughs> In retrospect, I would suggest to anybody that if they want to get a job in any craft, whether it's cooking or arc welding or, or anything, you should go to a liberal arts college and learn something about the world, become fascinating and become fascinated, and then go off and learn your handcraft and become something else. But don't just go to a trade school first and that's it, because you won't be as good a business person, you won't be as interesting, you won't have as many opportunities, and that's why you're all here anyway. So over the years. And no, I'm never discouraged. I want to cook every day of my life. How, how, how did your taste uh, change over the years, your own taste? I would say that um, my palate has become much more forgiving or appreciative of bitter much less easily convinced by sweet, much more interested in tart, 
and overwhelmingly salty. Ah. And is it, isn't it the case that uh, with age, bitter uh, becomes more acceptable? I think it's not that it becomes more acceptable. I think that you find it more intriguing. More intriguing. I think that's because you also meet more bitter people. <laughs> <laughs> and you we develop a taste for them. Yes, I mean, we certainly don't have a bitter audience. So, uh, who has the mic here? Yes, go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to say I really like the series of videos you did with Action Bronson. And I was wondering what it was like working with him. And I was wondering if there were other celebrities you liked working with. Thanks. Action Bronson. Um, I met Bronson be, as, a, as a result of actually doing a documentary with the guys from Vice that I didn't even know what Vice was yet. And they were doing um, a documentary on a guy named Danny Bowen, who has Mission Chinese, also an interesting character. Mm -hmm. um, and at the end of the day, uh, I said something. My kids had talked about Action Bronson, and, they, and uh, I had seen one of his videos early on. And at the end of the interview for the Danny Bowen stuff, I said, you, and, and what, what do you guys know about this action process? They said, well, we produce a show. I'm like, are you kidding me? You produce a show? I got to meet this guy. <laughs> so uh, they introduced me in the next couple of days. And he's a young uh, Albanian guy, rapper from Queens, who is, if you've seen his show, does a show called F That's Delicious. And uh, he goes at it. You can, it's one of, the, one of the funniest things is now that I know him pretty well, uh, we've become pretty good friends, and I know him probably maybe two and a half, three years. You can tell when he's traveling around that he has watched a lot of Molto Mario episodes. And sometimes he's trying to sound like me. And it's kind of funny to see because he's, he's kooky and crazy and funny. He's one of the more interesting palates and more interesting kind of open-minded food guys. For a long time, he didn't really enjoy seafood and he didn't really enjoy things he doesn't recognize. Now that he's been exposed to it for a long time, he's a great kind of soundboard to try new things and a lot of funny things. Having traveled around Europe, and he's in Paris, he's in Paris today. Um, he is one of the funniest naturalist guys that you could ever get a rise out, considering how much weed that guy smokes. It, <laughs> it, 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 it's paralytic to watch how much smoke these guys consume <laughs> and can still talk. Like, maybe you guys do it differently, but when I used to smoke weed, it was brown weed, and after two joints, you were done. This guy smokes the 21st century weed, like, incessantly and still talks. <laughs> now, if you watch the episode that we did of his show in Rome, they hit the brick. I don't know what it was, but they were all done, and they were like this, and I'm like, this is it? You guys, that's it? We're like a third of the way into the workday, and you guys are tired? I'm like, come on, let's go. We got a bunch of things to go, and they're like, Ugh. <laughs> but uh, fascinating guy. Have you ever seen him perform live? If he comes to town, you have to see him. He's one of the most reflective, thoughtful, and energetic art artists you'll ever see in any art form ever. I mean, just, he is a... That's quite a statement. Yeah. So let's go to another one from the web. I, I'm going to take a question from this side, too. So who has the mic? Go ahead with the, from the web. <coughs> you can speak up a little bit. Hi, this one's also from Facebook. So what is the future of genetically modified food stuff, mainstream and in restaurants? The future of genetically modified food stuff. Um, well, I, I think the first sale on GMOs was that we were in a crisis of production and didn't have enough food mm -hmm. to go around. As it turns out in America, we throw away 41% of our food. So I'm not ready to jump on the Monsanto bandwagon. Are they a sponsor here? No, 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 anybody? no, no. All right. You, you so I'm not ready. I'm not ready to jump on anybody's bandwagon. It takes us 10 years to get a cancer drug approved for someone who already is dying. It seems unusual that we have been able to brush this. And 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 I don't have any information that leads me to believe that there's anything that will occur if we properly test GMOs. Uh, certainly, maybe they give yield results, and maybe they don't even give us yield results. But that we would quickly test something and put it into production that could so quickly change all of the seed treasury that we have seems a little rushed. And I can tell you that in all of my experience with large corporations in the past, when they're not telling me everything, I'm pretty sure they're not telling me something I want to know. So I'm not against it yet, but I would say, let's get all the research in order before we figure it out. And I would say that the money that we're spending on GMOs Right now, it might be better to try to figure out a way to incentivize us not to throw away our food. 
I would say that if we're throwing away 40% of our food, if we could make it a capitalist move to actually save it and modify it and make it into a patty that we could sell at a fast food partner like one of the bigger fast food places, maybe the lentil patty at $1.29 could be the vegan opportunity for us to really save something and do something better for all of us. So I, I, I'm not against it, but I'm wondering why that much resources is going to So you're to taking more a European approach to that. Well, in, let's be very you're cautious. not even allowed to fly over Italy with yeah. GMO seeds. Yes. I kind of go with them. Mm. We're eating uh, them. They don't even fly over them. Yeah, 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 so and any other question from this side here? Do we have the mic? Yes. Yeah, right back there. Hi, Mario. Hi. So I know you love cooking. And so I was wondering if you ever tried your hand at brewing beer. I'm a home brewer myself. And I was wondering also what your favorite beer is, if you have one. What was the last also? Your favorite beer? Ah, um, I, my grandfather was a hop farmer in Washington State. We have a long and intimate relationship with beer in my family. <laughs> we were stealing beer from my grandfather when I was 10, <laughs> just for tasting. <laughs> um, I am a big fan of beer. My cousins are excellent <laughs> home brewers. I have only made a couple of home brews, none of which turned out to the quality that I've enjoyed. Um, I like a lot of beers that my cousin Derek LaFramboise makes. I would say of commercial beers, one of my favorite is one called Pilsner Urkel. Mm -hmm. But I like a lot of the small kind of crafty beers. It just depends on the batch. I find them almost uniformly inconsistent. But I like almost all beer. What I don't like is a super hoppy bomb that is so bitter that I can't. I, I enjoy beer with food just like I enjoy wine with food. So it has to do something to help me enjoy the, my food. So no I, uh, IPAs. No, I like IPAs, but like IPAs are good with stinky cheese. Yeah. But they're not like that good with oysters for me because I want to taste the oyster at the same time. So I found that like a kind of a lagery or a, or a pilsner works pretty much for almost all the foods that I really enjoy. But if you have a can of your beer, I would taste it. Yeah, if you have two, we would taste that. <laughs> Uh, yeah. You know, we talked a little bit about, for instance, the approach the Europeans have, you know, you know, especially outside the big cities, where you go to a restaurant, they have one seating, whereas we have multiple seatings. And how do you look at, uh, at that from your perspective? Because clearly, you know, you, you mastered the possibility of offering great food with mul and multiple seatings. And <laughs> well, I, I would say that the reason, they, the reason the Europeans tend to have only one seating is because they have yet to need more. Like the Europeans all kind of eat at the same time. The Spaniards eat a little bit later, yes. but you, could be, you would be very hard pressed to find some place to sit down and have dinner in Madrid even now at 7 p.m. Yes. And maybe even 8 p.m. I mean, even 8. Because there's just no demand. So in America, in, well, particularly in New York, there, there is a three shift work shift. So there's someone working at all times. There is someone ready to eat at all times. So we open our restaurant at 5.30 and Babo is full at 5.45. It is also full at 8.15. It is also full at 10.30. And in all honesty, we have theater. So it's full at 11.15 on a lot of the nights. We would be fools not to help serve those people. So we just have an entirely different experience. So, you know, our cooks work at a much different level and a much different pace. And uh, I, I don't know how a restaurant with only one turn could possibly make it unless it's run by a family in yeah, which case they, they don't really have to pay what a minimum wage is. You know, minimum wage in New York City next year is going to be $15 an hour for someone who's never, ever worked in a restaurant. So it's, it's all changing. What matters to me is let's make sure that our business, our industry is sustainable. We're just trying to figure out as all these things come at us, how we can make sure that Everyone has a job, everyone makes enough money, and uh, there's still profit to be had at the end of the year for those who took the capital risk. And we're, we're supporting. We want everyone to have a good living. Absolutely. Now, it's an easy question. What kind of customer do you like? What is your favorite type of customer? This whole room is a perfect ah, group. So no, I like customers who come in and want to try what we make. There's a particular group of New Yorkers who come in and don't really want what I make. They want, they're more interested in controlling the situation. They want to come in, they don't like their first table. They want to sit at a different one. I'm like, 
they're both flat. <laughs> That's what, yeah, and then they want to start modifying the menu. It's like, but, but our guys came in early today to make it like this. this. So you can take anything out of a dish that we don't put in it, but you can't put anything back in or you should cook at your house. We like customers that want to experience what we spent all of our lives getting ready to come to today to do. And that's the kind of customer. So that's like everybody. Most people understand the restaurant experiences. Here's what we do. We're going to go in. We're going to try their stuff. We're going to give our coat to the coat check person. We're going to sit down. We're going to order some drinks. We're going to order some food. We're going to pay our bill. We're going to give the coat check chick five bucks, and we're going to leave. That's a perfect customer. Now, you serve in Vegas restaurants expensive wines. And we also serve very affordable fairly wines. priced wines. And, and affordable wines. Yes. When you go to a restaurant, what kind of wine do you uh, order? <laughs> Any wine I want. Ah! No, it depends on where you are. Like if, if I'm in a restaurant, like if you're in a restaurant and, and wine isn't their thing, but they have some respectable wine, you drink that. But if you're in a restaurant that happens to have a vast selection of Pouligny Montrachet, you must try it to try make sure um, that uh, it's uh, still good. Yeah. No, but I mean like a restaurant that takes a lot of time to curate a wine list that I happen to understand or that they have invested in a sommelier or a wine team that can properly describe to me the nuance between two next to each other production facilities, then I want to hear about that and I will taste it. But and, uh, here's the trick. Here's the trick to any wine experience. What you say is how much you want to spend, and then you put it on the sommelier. Say, if I was going to get a Pinot Noir for $40 or $400 or $4,000, whatever the number is, say it's 50, which do you think would be the best one? Because then the onus is on them to try to impress you as opposed to you trying to pretend that you know the wine list better than them, and they wrote it. So of course they know the list. Which one is better? Which one is drinking better? Which one do you think will go better with this dish? Let them make the decision because that's what they're there for. And you tell them the price point first, maybe quietly so you don't have to make it a big deal at your table, but you let them know because their job is to help you. You know, the, uh, the other approach is to go for your own wine, the wine that you produce yourself and uh, you have an, on your wine list. I would never do that. Why not? Because I know what it takes. No, but for me as a oh, customer. Oh, well, yes, of course. As a customer, you could definitely choose my wine. But, and, and it's good, but I mean, invariably, that one is always going to be in the wine by the glass department, in which case yeah. you don't even have to risk it very much. You just yeah, need glass. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So tell us about why did you decide to go into winemaking? I don't really make the wine. I just invested in it. It's my partner, Joe Bastianich's yes. yeah. real passion is yeah. wine. And uh, he is building a legacy for his family. And I, I jumped on the bandwagon a little bit. He has uh, wineries in Friuli, where his family's from, which is the northeast part of Italy, uh, over by the Slovenian border, and also in Tuscany, um, in the Marema, the southwestern yeah. part of Tuscany, where the cowboys run. And uh, there's, a, there's a wine called uh, Ciliegiolo, that is a fantastic grape that makes something that is so delicious and so much like a Chianti and a little bit fruitier and really fantastic that I decided I wanted to get involved. And there's a piece of dirt called, La, it's called Mozza, which conveniently is the restaurant yeah. name in Los, yeah, Angeles. Los Angeles. But it meant that there was a tear in this particular piece of land, which Mozza is to tear apart. And the, the Mozza, which is what the, the Fattoria's name, it was this particular like little cave in the middle of it where a lot of snakes lived and we left it there next to a couple of old quince trees which is the logo on the on the <clears throat> actual label and it has this delicious kind of natural wine that was indigenous to the area for four or five hundred years and for me that's what wine expresses what wine expresses to me is the natural way the wind smells when it blows across those vines on a Thursday afternoon right before harvest and if you can capture that ephemeral flavor whether it's in the corn or the basil that you grow in your backyard if you can capture that any magnificence of that geospecificity in any way, any place, in any time, that is the ultimate job of any kind of farmer or producer. That's what makes it the most important. You were telling me about the grapes indigenous to Italy and you were talking about the grapes indigenous to uh, our uh, country here. And you were also comparing the two uh, wine, the types of wine. So uh, the, let me be very more direct. So. It's clear that your passion and your love is for Italian wine in general. Wh what do you think of our wines here? Who's we, Tonto? <laughs> Shall we you go mean further? American wine? Yes. I think 
first of all, Italy has 1,200 different grape varietals. In America, I would say that we probably celebrate 10. And you can list them right now. We, are, we have spent a long time chasing European wine, trying to make Bordeaux, Burgundy, Rhone varietals, or Moselle wines. And, and, and they're interesting, but they're not the ones from our dirt. I would be more interested if I could taste wines that express to me the Shenandoah Valley as opposed to the Moselle in the Shenandoah Valley. And when I taste California wines, I tend to taste expensive wines allocated to raise their prices, over-ripened, younger vines that create a fruit bomb that for me doesn't go very well with food and isn't very interesting. And it's also 200 bucks. So I can, I can go to almost any liquor store or wine store in any city in the entire country and get a great bottle of Village from France or a great bottle of a lower level Chianti or a Chiro from Puglia and drink something fantastic that has been shipped across the country, across the world, and get it for $14. Why would I spend $200 on a bottle of California wine that is being seriously sought over by a bunch of tech dudes in, in Napa <laughs> Valley? Like, yeah. let them have it. Let them have yeah, it. That is, the, the penalty for that wine is that you made too much money or your dad gave you all that money. You should be <laughs> stuck paying for that wine. That's if great. you made your own money, you wouldn't buy that wine. Yes, so we have a question here. <laughs> Hi, Mario. Um, right over here. How are you? Um, Good, how's it going? So, as you just heard before, a lot of us here are really excited about the opening of Italy uh, in a couple weeks. Um, but my question to you is, um, how do you think this new opening will affect the community and culture around all the small mom-and-pop Italian stores in the North End? <clears throat> that's, a very good, that's a very good question, because in all honesty, that was the first thing that a lot of people said to us in New York, particularly in Little Italy, and more significantly in the Arthur Avenue, which is really the real Little Italy. Uh, our Little Italy in New York kind of moved out and left a couple of things, but Arthur Avenue still exists. And I would say that we will not replace any one of them. We will, everyone will still shop in those places. They will come to our place just like they would go to Disneyland. And what will happen is that you'll get gastronauts, gastro tourists that will come here to go see what Italy is all about. But at the end of the day, Italy is still Italy. You're st they're going to go to the North End and they're still going to shop there because they're looking for the authentic Bostonian experience. And we shouldn't displace even one store. We shouldn't cause them to lose even one sale because they're still authentic to what they are. We brought in something new that is big and shiny and fancy and... And if you're going to buy Agnolotti, they're not selling our Agnolotti anyway. We're selling the kind that we make, which is from Piemonte. I don't think we should present any challenge to any one of them. And if they do, they should tell me, and I will bring them a check the day after it happens. But I would say that in Italy, I mean, Italy in New York City did not put anyone out of business. It put more fascination and more people interested in going to Lou De Paolo's place down in the northern part of Little Italy for, uh, for that experience in addition to their Italy experience. And I think that it works out well. I think it'll be, I think what happened in New York more significantly, and I can tell you if you have any real estate money to roll the dice on, that the real estate, the commercial real estate within two miles of Italy went up by 25% in the first year of opening because all of a sudden people wanted to build around that. Now, I think the proof's already pretty well built out. But if yeah. there was a backside, <laughs> I would might bet that within a mile there that it would be a better place to be. Mario, we are the backside here. Is this the backside? Yeah. So shall we build another Italy well, this way? I looked out. You already have new buildings going up yeah. over there. Can I get in on the ground floor? Absolutely. Any of those? That Absolutely. engineering facility? Absolutely. There's a guy, actually, Strega. You know, they, they, yeah, sure. they're opening uh, their uh, coffee shop here in the Fantastic. building. Fantastic. Yeah. But, so, but, but so we're going to break the contract and have you do it. No, no. No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm not coming in on his ground. That's his. Hi, this one's from Twitter. Um, people want to know more details about cooking in the White House. More details about cooking in the White House. Well, I got to do it. <laughs> um, I'm a big fan of the Obama administration. I'm a big fan of Renzi. I'm a big fan of the Obama's dogs, their daughters, their security, the house, everything about it. It was, <laughs> it was as far as a professional thing to do, it was the greatest thing I've ever done. It was the, the most proud that I've been able to be. It was, I got to bring four people with me, and they're the four people that have been with me the longest in my company. 
Um, we didn't get to bring any food. When I signed up for it, I thought for sure we were just going to roll in a van full of all the things that I made on my own time. And about a month before, they said, I said, so when can I bring the van down? They're like, you're not bringing a van into the White House, you idiot. I'm like, <laughs> what? He said, yes, we'll purchase the food and you guys can come make it. I'm like, how many is it for? 420? I said, how many people can I bring? Four. I'm like, what? <laughs> Turns out they have all these guys that work in the Navy mess, some of them SEALs, Navy SEALs. They're like, all right, so there's like 20 people that are helping us. Everyone's professional. Everyone's polite. Everyone's cool. Chef Chris Comerford, the executive chef of the White House, is fantastic. Her pastry chef Susie, the executive sous chef, uh, were just such delightful people. Tommy, his name was. It was, a, it, was a, it was a dream come true. And I mean, you're in the White House. Like, you go in the elevator from the ground floor to the pastry kitchen to the dining room area, and then the third floor is the Obama's house. And you're like... Every time I got in the elevator, I pushed the third floor. I needed a special <laughs> necklace. But I was just thinking I'd see President Obama walking around his pajamas with a robe. I'm like, hey, you want to make some spaghetti or something? <laughs> it didn't happen. But I must say, you know, you're in the prep kitchen and the Rose Garden's like from me to you. And uh, we're watching, you know, apparently in, if you're in the White House, you're watching MSNBC 24-7. I don't know. Yeah. Fox was not on. I'll <laughs> And I'm watching it, and like they start this chit-chat, him and Renzi, and he's speaking Italian, and Renzi's speaking uh, English. And, and, and the guys are like, well, you can go out there and look. I'm like, what do you mean go look? I said, it's, it's right over there. I hadn't really done any careful inspection. I walk out there, and I'm literally this far from Obama. I'm like, I could have disrupted something. I could have, I could have thrown a whipped cream pie at somebody. I mean, I was right there. But I'm watching him, and he's cracking jokes, and he's just like, you know, he's, I'm going to miss that guy. Yeah. But, um, but it was fantastic. So and my, then, uh, my who chose the wine? They did. They did. And it was all American. Yes, I and know when, that. And when we were choosing the menu, they said we would love some Italian style dishes, but we want to use almost exclusively American ingredients because they're proud. And I was, it was cool. So I did a sweet potato agnolotti. Then I did a frise salad with roasted Hubbard squash and fennel pollen, arrope and pecorino di New York. And then I did a, a <laughs> beef dish with... Um, called the bracciola, but I took a tenderloin and I filled mm -hmm. it with breadcrumbs and fontina was the one <coughs> ingredient I used from Italy and some herbs and I did a salad of uh, green apples and horseradish over the top and then we did a, a green apple tart with uh, buttermilk gelato and a thyme caramel and they were happy and then, and then Gwen Stefani gets up and sings and my wife's sitting at a table with James Taylor and Chance the Rapper and you're like, man, this is badass. And I go over to say hello to Mr. and Mrs. Obama and and Jerry Seinfeld sitting there, and there's, you know, it was like, what the hell? Why haven't I been here with this song? Yeah. It took me eight years to get an invite to this house. Uh -huh. So did you have your Crocs? Of course, I wore this close. This is my uniform. That's great. And, you know, Mrs. Obama, a fine understander of both fashion and style, <laughs> brought up the fact that I didn't put on my formal wear to go to this event. And it reminded me and everyone in the room that I am the cook at this event. <laughs> <laughs> and that's all right. I was happy to be there. Okay. So questions on this side now, this side here. Hi. Um, seeing as Thanksgiving's coming up and it's considered one of America's best holidays, what do you consider is your favorite traditional dish? And what dish do you make for Thanksgiving that you would consider untraditional? Good question. I'm, I, I make almost always the same ingredients. I have a turkey, I have stuffing, I have some kind of a mashed something, I have something with Brussels sprouts, I have some kind of a vegetable-y, bakey something. But I do it by theme. So three years ago I did Alsace-Lorraine, last year I did New Orleans, this year I'm doing Umbria. So I take all the bones out of my turkey and I make a stuffing with ciabatta and fennel sausage and caramelized fennel <clears throat> and some fennel pollen and I roll up my turkey like a porchetta and I cook it in wow. my pizza oven. Wow. When you do that, oh. first of all, it doesn't look like a turkey anymore. It looks like a giant torpedo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but when you carve it, there's no bones. So when you carve it, you cut it straight down, and in it is a pinwheel of dressing. On the outside is crispy skin with a little bit of the fennel pollen redolent. Oh my God. Tuscan okay, oh my God, what's going on here? And then I make a gravy because I take my bones out before I can make the stock in advance. I roast the bones really dark, and I make a gravy with vin santo and black truffles. Mm. Yes, you want an invitation to my house. Yeah. Exactly. We're all invited. 
Then I make mashed sweet potatoes and I stir in whole cloves of garlic that I've caramelized with cinzano rosso. I make a shaved Brussels sprout salad with blood oranges, shaved fennel, pecorino, and um, Chianti vinegar. <clears throat> and then I make, um, must be something else. Oh, then I make, um, instead of, I make a crepe out of uh, chestnut flour called nechi. Now and I, I take braised Swiss chard oh. and I mix it with, uh, almost like a cream spinach, with bechamel and lots of nutmeg. And I roll them up tight and I bake them with a little bit of bechamel over the top. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And then we drink it, this year we're drinking it with uh, um, Capri Mo, uh, Montefalco, Montefalco Rosso. Oh, it's going to be good. And do we have another question like this one? <laughs> and then for on dessert, food. I'm making Castagnaccio, which is the unleavened chestnut flour crepe with um, red wine grapes cooked in just a little bit of Chianti. Oh. And you dust it with just a little bit of that and you serve it with uh, Vin Santo and Moscato d'Asti, which at 6% alcohol qualifies as a breakfast wine. In my yeah. Uh, so another question here on this side. Who has the mic? If you have the oh, mic, go ahead. Hi, Mario. Hi. Um, very oh, big fan. As someone who's worked in restaurants and also experienced um, eating at home for dinner with your family, where do you see the future of that going? Because more and more families don't eat dinner together and more and more restaurants don't cook for their employees. It's a good one. Well, <coughs> the good thing is, pardon me, I'm a little wheezy right now. Take a little LSD, I'll be just fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, the, I mean, the future of the home meal is obviously in your hands. And I would suggest two things. Cook more often. Cook more simply. Make the meal required. And most significantly, when you finish the meal, let the dirty plate sit on the table for 20 minutes because it sets the tone for the conversation. If every single part of your day is doing something and you need to get it done and then the next step is doing something else, put your phones in a stack. They're calling. I don't know why. They keep calling you. I don't know. It's because too many people have my damn phone number. <laughs> put your phones in a stack and at the end of the meal, don't make the move. Let everyone sit and understand that we're going to sit here for 20 or 30 minutes and just chat. You can't do anything but chat. You can't clear because that sets the tone for the conversation that can happen and should happen. If you have kids, that sets them up for understanding that this is crucial and valuable time. If it's your roommates, you should all agree to it at least once or twice a week in college. We're going to sit here and talk for 20 minutes with their dirty plates in front of us because it sets a tone for the rest of our life. If every single moment has to be moving forward, we're never going to find time to relax. We're never going to get to know each other. And we're never going to be able to relax and kind of meditate on the meal and the beginning of digestion and the beginning of our conversation and knowing each other. My restaurants will always have a family meal. No matter what the rule is, no matter whether we get a meal credit or whether anyone gets to take a meal credit, it is crucial time. And it's also at that time we have a rule that after everyone's done eating and we're still talking about wine or we're talking about service tonight, 10 minutes you do not clear the table. Because if every time you're doing something, you're always moving forward and you're always moving on to your next project yeah. and you're always looking at your phone, you're trying to figure out who's Snapchatting who or what's the next Twitter thing is, you're, we're losing perspective on it. And we, it, it could be argued that we lost it. But if you slowly start taking back quiet, personal time, and that's evolving food to start, but then I would suggest that you grab personal time in the daytime. Start meditating. Take 20 minutes twice a day. Take 20 minutes to reflect on something. Just take 20 minutes to look at a building from outside and don't say anything to anybody. Try to find 20 or 10 minute slots five or six times a day. You will feel better about life and you will reflect that on every conversation that you have. You will be a better person and we will be better people. It's great. Let's go back to the web. <laughs> um, this one's from Twitter again. So we want to know what your favorite restaurants in Boston are. It's very easy to pick a fight that way. <laughs> so instead of choosing favorite restaurants, I'll tell you some of my favorite chefs. I love Lydia Shire. I love Michael Schlau. I love Ming Tsai. I love Ken Oranger. I love Jamie Bissonette. I love Jasper White. I love Susan Regis. 
and I love anybody that's ever been to any of my restaurants ever before. <laughs> and I'll tell you, in the next six months, I'm going to be here a lot, and I'm going to go to all of the great restaurants in this town. So you're going to have an apartment here? No. You yeah, know what? I can invite you. You can stay with us oh, here I'll in stay this dorm. I'm happy to stay here, but what I realized in the last two years, I realized that I don't need to buy property. Property is prison. Absolutely. I want to get rid of almost everything I own and stay in fancy hotels because there's a little something called OPS, other people's sheets. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. Do, you, do you see this view here? We have a great view. I did. Okay, the 16th floor. Oh, I was yes, thinking we, I was just going to take your office. But my, my office is boring. Oh, but the it's promos, a nice size with a great view. Yeah. I could put a little shower over there in the corner in a tub. Would you like that? I would. Okay, well, they consider it done. <laughs> I'm uh, moving in. Yeah, moving in. So another question here. Who has the mic? I think I... Ciao, Mario. Ciao. Um, I'm interested to know uh, why you chose Boston specifically for your next Italy location. <laughs> it's a complicated... Thing that we measure the amount of people that can get to the town, the opportunity to do a good real estate deal with good partners, and what we perceive to be a solid gastronomic culture. And Boston has all of it. I would say on the entire eastern seaboard outside of New York City, Boston is the number, it's the next town for us. It's a fantastic place. It's very different from New York, it's very easy to get to, and um, the kind of food and culture that you have that already grows up around here is something that's very easily translatable into the Italian culture. And if I can get Nantucket Bay Scallops even one more day a year because I live up here, I'm moving in. Yeah, that's great. That's great. A question on this side. Who, who has the mic? If you have the mic, please go ahead. Hi. I'm Hi. George Brzezicki. Um, Hi, George. Uh, closer. Closer? Yes. yes. There you Is go. that better? Okay. Where we live, uh, Italian wine is very limited in availability. There's like one little shelf in the uh, liquor store. Can you recommend other sources for uh, trying and getting Italian wine and maybe resources? So where do you live? Google. New Hampshire. New Hampshire. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Come to Italy. How we far away is cows. that from here? Not far. Is that an hour? Less. An hour. Okay. So I would travel an hour. <laughs> Italy is going to have 1,200 different wines starting in two weeks. We do free wine tastings every day. We taste food and wine. There's an opportunity to taste a lot of different varietals. We're all about that. So we've answered your question, sir. Just come to Italy as soon as you want. And, and where, do you work here? No. Where do you work? I work out of my home. Oh, out of your home. Well, we can also give you a, a room here <laughs> next to his. You can share my room. I'm not yeah, going to be here every exactly. day. Exactly. So somebody wanted to ask a question on this side. Who has the mic? If you have the mic, go ahead. Hello. Um, so I feel like vegetarian food gets kind of a bad rep with the general population. Uh, what are you, how do you think you can make it interesting and what do you love to do with vegetarian food to make it appeal to a <coughs> broad audience? Um, I think the problem is calling it vegetarian food. I think if you lose that stigma, like when I go to vegetarian restaurants, I'm never that excited about it, first of all, because I'm sitting around with a bunch of smug people who think they're better. <laughs> but if you go to an Italian restaurant and eat vegetarian food, it doesn't have to have all of that political attachment to it, nor does it have to have the loftier than thou. There's a lot of vegetarian and vegan options in all of my restaurants. And, and, it's, it, and, and, and removing the meat from a vegetable dish isn't that hard because it's generally either bacon or prosciutto, and you just don't put it in it. So, I think the problem is that you have to categorize the entire restaurant as vegetarian, which makes the cooks not as happy to be involved in it. But you can eat vegetarian and vegan food in a lot of restaurants, particularly, particularly in Indian food and, and also Southeast Asian food and Italian food and even French food to a certain extent and a lot of Spanish food. Go to restaurants without having that whole rule and just eat their food. I mean, keep in mind though, when you eat vegetarian food in Rome, 
they think prosciutto is a vegetable. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they cook a lot of things in guanciale, yes. which is the rendered fat of the cheek bacon. So like ask them if they're cooking it in guanciale because they think that's still vegetarian too. But remove the rules and just say, I want to eat all of these delicious vegetarian things or vegetable-based things. And it's, it's quite easy then. So I love vegetarians. I, I think some of my favorite things to eat were vegetarians. <laughs> so who has the mic on this side? We don't have much time Hi, left, so go ahead. Thank you for being ahead. with us today. Thank you. My question is about tipping and the wages that staff make with the... I don't know, last time I was a waitress, it was 2.15, I think, an hour. Do you think that we're, as the Americans, we're going to change that method? We're going to go back to, go to more of a European? It's a good question. Um, it's, 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 it's shaking the foundation of everything we know. This, uh, the idea that maybe tipping will be included or that tipping will, there won't be any tipping or that, since everyone's going to be making $15 an hour, no matter what job they have, that tipping will go away. We're, we're still, the jury's still out on us. And in New York City, it's everyone's just standing around waiting for the first one to blink. Because you don't want to make a mistake. You don't want to diminish the greatness of every employee's contribution. You do not want to insult anyone, nor do you want to challenge a consumer who is quite happy with the tipping process. I don't think Americans don't want to tip. I don't think Americans want to pay three times as much as they used to for their entrees either. So we're trying to figure it out. The governments are doing what they're supposed to do, which is increase the minimum wage for everybody and make it a living wage. And I respect that. It's a, an honorable task. Uh, and it's an honorable idea. What it means to, for most restaurants, if they're just going to simply take someone who used to make $4 an hour and make them make $15 an hour, is that the cost will eventually be passed on to the consumer. Just flat out. And that's not what they're telling everybody. They're telling everybody that we're giving everyone a working wage. What they're not telling you is that anybody who makes a working wage will no longer be able to go out to a, to a, to a restaurant. So we're all in the middle of it. <clears throat> we, have <clears throat> we have no answers. We have absolutely nowhere to go on this. <clears throat> As it stands right now, we haven't raised our prices and we haven't changed our tipping policy. But we have uh, absorbed uh, a higher wage. And we're just kind of hoping something's going to change. I don't really have an answer. But I like to tip. I'm a tipper. No. I'm a planner, too. I plan my vacations. Like, I do a lot of crazy stuff. <laughs> so, Mario, let's talk about your foundation. OK. Tell us a little bit what, about it. What got you to focus on that aspect? I realized maybe 12 years ago that at a certain point in my life, I was getting between two and 300 asks a week for charitable contributions to anything. Anything from raising money for the brass band in the richest county in the United States to helping people feed people in their hometown on Thanksgiving. And I thought to myself, well, how could I possibly focus all of my efforts on something that means a lot to me? And I decided that what I consider to be the most important building blocks in our American culture is giving children the opportunity to achieve their best then. And I identified three things that I thought were getting in their way. The fundamental and largest one is children's hunger relief. In a time of the richest country of the world, of all time, having one in five children be food insecure is the most improbable and preposterous thing I could ever imagine. And that we throw away 42% of our food every day makes it even compounded to make us seem to be the most foolish of people at all time. And that since maybe 19, the mid-1970s, hunger relief has been hijacked to be part of the charity component of our world as opposed to the investment part of our world makes me even more perplexed. Because it would seem to me that feeding children so that they can be the best students ever and make us the smartest country, or at least in the top 30, which we're not, uh, is is obviously shooting ourselves in the foot. And that, that, that wouldn't be the most important category. Like, we don't have the answer to all leukemia. But we do have the answer to hunger relief. It's food. And we even have it. It's not like we even need to make it. We just need to figure out a distribution program and a platform that can incentivize through profit a way to get the food to the people who need it. So my fundamental goal in my foundation is children's hunger relief. And I work on things with the food banks 
Food Bank for New York, I developed a cook shop program which is developing recipes and a training program and videos for kids whose main food sources are either food pantries or food kitchens and helping them learn through their caregiver, whether it's their brother, their babysitter, their mom, their grandma, whoever, how they can learn how to identify things as simple as what's a, what's a sweet potato? What does raw produce look like? How do I cook it? How do I make it? What do I make out of it? How do I make a quesadilla? How can I make things with the limited resources that a food pantry might have? So I do a lot of that. And I, raise, I don't raise an, an astronomic number of money a year. I raise about a million or a million five, and I give it about a third of it to a, to a little bit more than that to a food bank and for f uh, hunger relief research and ideology. Then the next one is uh, orphan diseases. Uh, I realize I'm never going to cause any giant movement like my friend Michael J. Fox <laughs> does for his charity, and he does a fantastic job and has raised, I believe, $600 million in 10 years and does a fantastic job researching that. We've actually taken the money that we've raised, and any of the friends and family that I have that have been touched by a particular disease, whether it's neuroblastoma or an insulin inability, uh, we give twenty-five dollars to $50,000 grants to these small researchers to get them started. And it just makes us feel good that we're participating with our family and friends. We probably won't fix something, but it's a, it's a little penance. It makes us feel like we're participating in sometimes it's the first time any of these diseases have seen any research money come at them. So it gets them started and maybe it'll help a little bit. And the third is literacy guarantee. So it's hunger relief, disease research, and literacy guarantee. And my foundation has built 16 libraries in the last three years. And we've funded them with books and we've put our brand on it and we've helped them continue to build and build and uh, also have librarians go in, specialists who help understand and manage the library use and help the kids get someone to read to them. Uh, they're almost always in places where I do business, so we're building one in Boston in next spring. And the employees that work in my restaurants or in my grocery stores go and actually read to the kids on a weekly basis because it makes them feel good uh, to be part of something that's working on it. So that's fundamentally all we do. We do three things. That's, that's wonderful. Uh, our community is very engaged in uh, service, so we'll be very happy to go to your library and also uh, read uh, whatever uh, it's you... Fantastic. Now, let me tell you something. You're terrific. You're a natural educator because you speak with ease, you make people laugh, you make people cry, you, you move us all. Nobody cried, did you and, yet? And well, you don't know. You can't see everybody here. But if I offer you a job as a here, would you come and be a professor? I'm a little busy for a full-time job. And so why not? You can have multiple careers in life. Yes. Well, I'm looking for a new gig sometime soon. What would be the, your next gig? I'm imagining that after we get a couple more Italy's growing, I would love to do something in agriculture. Farming. Farming. Kimchi production. Cheese. You told me cheese. 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 Something. Something but handmade. Handmade. Why kimchi? I love fermentation. Sausage, yes. I'm good at that already. Yeah. Um, I, love, I, I just love fermentation. I think fermentation in, in the leap between rotten and magnificent is something I've always loved. There's a fine line, a thin red line, and I want to taste it. We will be there to taste it with you. Fantastic. Can you invite us uh, for Thanksgiving too? Yeah, well, Thanksgiving. Okay, this side. Uh, this, this side. Okay. <laughs> this. No, I only have 22 people coming over. It's easy. That means I don't. After 30, cooking becomes work. Under 30, it's pretty good. That's your color. That is my color. So it's for you. Thank you That's very much. That's my gift to you. <laughs> now, we have something more for you. Fantastic. But wait, there's more. Are we standing up? Yes, because... Have you not supposed to leave? Yeah, no, no, because apparently I have to put it on your head. I know you don't wear that anymore, but they told me to do it. And no I problem. Don't know whether I'll... Well, make it a little bit bigger, shall we? Excuse me, Mr. President. Yes. We also uh, have a surprise for you as well. For me? Yes, uh, I love it. Yeah, yeah. That's good. Right. So, Mario, now it's your turn. Put mine here, and that's, uh, that's good. Ah, uh, voila. That's good. Here. That's great. Now it's time for us to cook. Let's get ready. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.